the remarkable diversity of science. Not only are Ram and I originally from different countries, we, we live on different, different shores, we studied in different fields, and we got a PC and a Mac. So, um, in fact, science can handle almost anything. It's really wonderful. So let me get you a magenta scribbler, and we should be ready to roll here. Um, thank you. It's an honor and a privilege, and to follow Ram is such a thrill. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about future surprises and some things we're pretty sure of, what we've learned from the ice sheets. And let's um, maybe put it in a different way. Let's see if we can figure out how to tame the long tail of the distribution that Ram was showing you there just a minute ago. All right. Start somewhere else, though. Many of you, like me, like Ram, are scientists here, and most of the time we're sort of nice, friendly, uh, modest human beings. We don't brag in front of our students very often, but you know something? We've got the best job and the best job description of anybody out there. I mean, what's the job description? Like, go out and learn what nobody else in the world knows, share it with other people, and help them use that knowledge to do useful things. Right? That's the idea. You know, and yeah, our university thinks that's research, teaching, and service, but that's what we do. Learn what nobody knows and share it with people and help them. And if you don't believe that, you just saw it. Okay? How to help people by, by using science. You just saw it there. Okay? And we do this by the scientific method, and we all learned this in fourth grade, and it was a list of words that included hypothesis somewhere in there. But what really are we doing is, first of all, making the recognition that there's a whole lot of smart people in the world and that we probably ought to learn from them, and learning from them should not be predicated on whether we're closely related to them genetically or ideologically. They're smart. We should learn from them. And the second piece is to recognize when we learn from these smart people that they are human and that the smart as they are, we can do better. We can find new ideas. We can test those new ideas. We can keep the best ones. We have to work really, really hard not to fool ourselves. And that's probably the biggest piece of the scientific mechanism is making sure that the idea works against nature and we're not fooling ourselves. And that piece of it is where we get in trouble with the world, because what that piece says is, thou shalt argue. And if you're going to be a scientist, you spend your life tearing, trying to tear down what other people did. And if you fail, it's got to be really good and it's got to be really solid. And as a consequence of that, if we inside know we're arguing, and we inside sort of have a pretty good idea what's solid and what's speculative and what's just silly. And the people outside, the policymakers, don't. And they lift the lid of science and they look under and what do they see? Us arguing. And they slam the lid down and they run away in terror. And this is... <laughs> This is something that has driven them crazy for years. And what's happened finally is that the, 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 the policy makers who are really thinking about this say we need assessment of science. They said we need to get the scientists to sit down, to agree to act for the public good, to agree to act in the public eye, usually on their own nickel, not the governments, to get the full range of views, and then to tell what do we know, what don't we know, what is solid, what is speculative, what is just silly. Now, this is not a new idea. In the United States, you know, right down here someplace, in the United States back in 1863, 18, there was a little bit of problem, as some of you know, and Abe Lincoln said, you know, I need some good advice. He said, I've got to get these people to act for the country and tell us what they know. And so he got Congress to charter the National Academy of Sciences, and it serves as the advisor on science to the government. And it gets the whole range of views. And some of these so-called skeptical scientists on climate have served on the committees of the National Academy, and they have signed on the dotted line what I'm going to show you next. It's a very interesting thing. Other countries have their national academies. The, the, nas the main uh, professional bodies have, have their uh, assessment. The United Nations for climate, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, get the world scientists, get a representative of all the nations, of all the peoples, of all the views, get them to sit down in the public view, agree to act for the public, and tell the policymakers what they know. What I'm going to show you next, some of what Ram was showing you, is the assessed science. 
This is what comes out of the world scientists, not one individual pushing their own particular thing. You will occasionally see the press say, well, the IPCC says this, but this person disagrees. That's false balance. There is no comparison between those two. And you will find this if you go read the assessment. So what do we know if we look at the climate question from the assessed literature? What we know is many things. We are raising CO2. We are otherwise changing the atmosphere in ways that are changing the climate with high scientific confidence. This is affecting ecosystems. This is affecting economies. The changes that we have seen are large enough that we can test our understanding of them. We can demonstrate that models that were run in the past are skillful. We can demonstrate that they have made projections that actually are being borne out. The changes are large enough that many people in many parts of the world know about it, and the changes are small enough that people in some parts of the world don't know about it unless they're paying attention. It is still possible on a cold morning in Pennsylvania for my neighbor to say, hey, don't you love that global warming? <laughs> okay, it, this, this still does happen, okay? <laughs> um, okay. Um, if we take the models that are proven skillful against the changes that have occurred and which are scientifically unequivocal, and we run those models into this future, our neighbors will not have any doubt about what's coming. The changes so far are very small compared to the changes that can come under business as usual. That's the assessed science. It's fairly straightforward. This confidence is now as high. What do we find? The damages from this grow to exceed the costs of doing something about it. If you take your climate model, you couple it to an economic model, and you say, let's just make people as wealthy as we can, what does come out is you should be investing now to head these changes off. You also should be investing now to help the people who are already being impacted and will be impacted by the things that are unavoidable at this point. If you were to come visit us at Penn State and you run across campus from where I live, you'd go over and talk to the Rock, Rock Ethics Institute, and the ethicists would say, okay, that's your economic optimization, which is get started now. But they'd say, you know something? There's a big ethical issue or two or three here. And the simplest way to put it is those people who are least responsible for global changes are the people who are most impacted by global change. And the ethicists and many others would say, you know, is that right? And so they would say, maybe you should be doing more. The economic analysis says invest now, but maybe you should be investing a little more now because there are ethical considerations in here. The costs are highly uncertain because they depend on things that aren't invented yet. They depend on things that we know the sketch of. But overall, the, the sketch is that if we were to get serious about this in a small number of decades, you can generate the things that we now enjoy from energy cleanly in a carbon neutral way for something like 1% of the world economy per year. And I can spin that in various ways for you. I can, oh, it's just 1%. I can say, that's almost a trillion dollars a year, okay? And it's the same thing. And you know you can spin this in various ways, but it's not the end of the world huge impossible to do. And this comes out, working group two, working group three, the, the German government, others have looked at this, and these are the sort of numbers that come. Okay? Now, this is real science. It has real uncertainties, and those are... <sighs> worrisome. And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about. That's what I've worked on is, is those uncertainties, because what do we see? The warming might be a little less, it might be a little more, it might be a lot more. If we see anything wrong with the models over time, it's that the world seems to have changed a little more than the models like. If you look at any of the projections that the, the IPCC supplies, they are smooth. If you look at any history of the climate, it is bumpy. And a change that is less expected and arrives more rapidly is harder to deal with. The projections have said the ice sheets are going to behave themselves. The ice sheets are not behaving themselves very well right now. And so when we look at the uncertainties, unfortunately, they're sort of on the bad side. And if you were to say, let's take the best estimate of what we get, the most likely thing is that we face problems that can be solved if people address them. 
and they can be solved without completely breaking the bank. And yes, the uncertainties are such that the problems might actually be smaller than that. And don't kid anybody, they might be. It might warm a little bit less. We might have missed something somewhere. And it might be a little worse than that. And there's a long tail of the distribution. We flew out on the plane very long ago. And you know what happens when you fly. You know, the most likely thing is you're sort of seated next to somebody else and you can't get your elbows out and the plane is bumping around in turbulence and you get there 10 minutes late. And you know, so your most likely outcome is that there's things that you're not very happy about on the plane. And it might be better than that. You might have an empty seat next to you and you, they upgrade you to first class and you know, you have a great flight. And you know, maybe you, you really, you're sitting next to the person that hangs over into your seat and it's really rough. And maybe while you're sitting next to the person who hangs over into your seat, the plane flies into a mountain and you're dead. Okay? <laughs> those of us in the developed world, those of us who actually have money and are here to celebrate the Tyler Prize, all, we expect things to be almost as good as they can be. Not everybody in the world is that true for already, but let us look at the future and say that while it could be better and it could be worse, there is a long tail of the distribution that could be really bad. Let me look at it a few different ways. If you look at the warming that's expected, right down here at this little one at the bottom, there is some central estimate. It might be a little bit less, it might be a little bit more, it might be a lot more. Notice at the top, we keep talking about global average surface temperature. Nobody lives in the global average surface temperature. The global average change is what happens out in the Pacific Ocean. What happens on land is that essentially everybody gets above average warming because the land warms more than the ocean. This really is Lake Wobegon, and that is not something that's to be proud of. Let me take you to the ice sheets. Um, I have gone. I don't get to go as much as I used to. It's a wonderful thing if you ever get the chance to go. The ice sat, and this is Greenland, and the ice sat right here at the Little Ice Age, and now it's back up there and racing away. Uh, this one is not as, as important as the same glaciers doing this in the Himalaya, but um, uh, these are some caribou out on the ice sheet trying to get away from the mosquitoes, and this is a muskox, and these are some, this is an Arctic fox, and... This is, I've shown many of you this picture over the years. We have been in Greenland a month. The USA Today over here in the corner is a month old, okay? And it is perfectly fine. <laughs> Good day in Greenland, bad day in Greenland. Um, and, <laughs> okay, we went to Greenland to drill ice cores. We pulled the ice cores out of the ground. We read the ice cores. These are a few of the things that I was involved with. There's a big community doing wonderful things. Uh, the bolded ones are people might be out here by tomorrow. When we show an ice core record, I can pound on the table and say this is a climate record, and that's why. And so here is a climate record. It starts 17,000 years ago. This is green is temperature in Greenland. Red is snowfall. Comes up to the day. The last time that we had a really big warming, different cause, but the last time we had a really big warming, it did not arrive smoothly and gradually. It staggered. And these staggers are actually fairly big. In Greenland, that one is about 10 years, order of 10 years is about 10 Celsius, 18 Fahrenheit. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, up to sort of Bangor, Maine, something like that in 10 years. Okay, now that's, that's a big climate change. When you see a smooth curve, hope for that. This particular one, so Greenland staggered. What's the big deal? Um, here's a comparison between a little window. If you take this sort of light blue band right in here and blow it up, that's the green curve on top. And the blue one here is a record from a cave formation in China from Larry Edwards' group, Wang et al. Um, and what actually happened is when Greenland got cold in all of these stagger events, um, the monsoon weakened. And there's a couple of billion people sort of are waiting for that to rain on their crops. And it's not Greenland that you're worried about. Um, and what, you know, so we've looked at what is that? What, what, what's going on? And so these are some of the other papers that I've had a little to do with that, that looked at what that is. And I think we can say with pretty good confidence that when there was a big warming, it staggered in drunkenly that what was going on is that if you melt too much ice too rapidly, the North Atlantic surface freezes in the winter in places that it used to not freeze. Doesn't 
bring you an ice age. It doesn't make a great movie. It doesn't um, do much to the summers, but it really changes the winters, and that really changes some other things, and every time it did it, the monsoons weakened, and you get drying in Africa, drying in Asia, and southward motion of the tropical circulation in the Americas, and that's a small number of billions of people that see loss of their rainfall, and a few get a gain. The IPCC looked at this, and they say, we have 90% confidence that, that Greenland won't melt fast enough to do that in the next century. 90%. But 90 is not 100. And faster is harder in this particular case. And so there, there's an interesting thing that's sitting there. All right. Now, um, that ice sheet that we were drilling into is a big pile of water. If you took that ice sheet and dumped it in the ocean, the east coast, you would lose more than the red. Um, I didn't do a west coast to scare you, but on the east coast, you would do more than the red. We don't think that this could happen faster than centuries, but within decades, we may commit ourselves to this. This is not a worst case. We could make color a bunch more red if we wanted a worst case. Okay, now... We've looked at this a little bit, what the ice sheets are doing, and um, and 2001, the IPCC looked at the ice sheets and they said, you know, we are uncertain about the ice sheets. There are big unknowns about this. There's a lot we don't know what to do about. But they said the best estimate is the flow won't change, and it'll snow more on top, and we've got 100 years before the ice sheets start raising sea level. The mountain glaciers will raise sea level, the ocean will warm and expand, but we've got 100 years before the ice sheets do it. And in 2007, the IPCC looked at the ice sheets and said, oh, crap. <laughs> Not quite in those words. They said that, that um, the models, the, the ice sheets are shrinking. They're putting water in the ocean, and in part, it's because of warming. And they're 100 years ahead of schedule. And they said the models used today do not include the full effects of changes in ice sheet flow because of basis. And published literature is lacking. Our understanding is too limited to provide a best estimate or an upper bound on sea level rise. Okay, and they gave numbers. You've seen the numbers, and the numbers aren't terribly uh, appalling. Uh, they still matter to real people, but they've got this little box at the top, which you can't read from the back. I'll read it. It says, excluding future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow. Okay, if the ice goes, it goes. All right, so what do we know? Here's a couple things. 1960 is on your left, and 2010 is uh, over 2008, the data go all the way up to, to essentially modern. And on top is a coastal temperature record from Greenland. It was sort of warm, and it got cold, and it warmed up again. And Greenland was sort of shrinking and raising sea level, and then it stabilized, and now it's shrinking and raising sea level. Greenland doesn't care who makes it warm. If it gets warm, it tends to melt. And we've just put this one out, the CCSP, the U.S. government report. And this is looking at how big the ice sheet was or how much sea level from the ice sheet at various temperatures. Modern is here. And when it was warmer in the past, Greenland had put some water in the ocean. And when it was a few degrees warmer in the past, Greenland was gone and it raised sea level 7.3 meters. So, um, and when it was colder in the past, Greenland was bigger. Now, in fact, Warmer makes more snow on top, but the more it snows, the smaller the ice sheet is because the melting winds. And Greenland doesn't care who made it warm. When it gets warmer, it melts. And it may also change its, its flow. We've been looking at that a little bit as well. And um, there's a lot of pieces to this. I'll show you the one that gets the press. It's sort of fun. If you want to follow stories on this, it's neat. Meltwater goes to the bottom of Greenland, and it, it can thaw frozen beds, and it can make things flow faster. And how it gets to the bottom, a, a former student worked on this, Sarah Doss, as well as Ian Jockin, who's a colleague. And there's these big lakes in Greenland, and the big lakes in Greenland open up crevasses, and they drain to the bed, and here's Sarah over one of the crevasses, and they dump Niagara Falls for an hour into the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and this is a process that can make the ice move faster. And so there's a lot of things that say we make it too warm and Greenland can shrink. Okay, now Greenland's a little pile, Antarctica's a big pile. There's only a tiny bit of warming going on in Antarctica in some places. Other places locally are warming fairly rapidly. But there's a little warming going on in Antarctica, and what do we find? As cold as it is, Antarctica is now contributing to sea level rise. It's shrinking and putting water in the ocean with fairly high confidence for just a little bit of warming. Okay? And what's going on there is a slightly different set of processes. Um, very interesting one. I'll just show you one of them here. Down here at the bottom, if you can see it, we're in Antarctica, and we're going to go right here to the peninsula, you know, that finger that sticks up towards South America. The white on this 
map is ice that's sitting on rock, and the green on this map is ice that's still attached but is floating. It's called an ice shelf. And the ice shelves run out, and here's an ice shelf over here, which is running out from the, the great spine of the peninsula. The flow comes out here, and then it breaks off in the ocean out here, and there's friction with islands. And so that friction holds back the shelf, and the shelf holds back the ice behind it. And this place has been getting warmer, and there's now meltwater in the cracks. This particular ice shelf formed 10,000 years ago as the ice sheet shrank from the Ice Age. It sat there for 10,000 years until January 31st of 2002, and then over the next month it changed. So let me first make the labels go away, and then let me make the ice shelf go away. And it fell apart. And you'd, you'd drive your kayak through this hash up here. Now, this is already floating. It doesn't raise sea level. But when that became unplugged, this thing is now going eight times faster. That does raise sea level. Fortunately, there's only a little tiny bit of ice behind that one to raise sea level. You can't do much there. What happens if it gets warmer down here or down here or over here? There is a lot more ice behind it. And so we're seeing a little bit of warming is causing a rise in sea level from acceleration to flow, and we get a little nervous that a lot of warming might cause a lot of acceleration. And we haven't quite gotten to the point yet of, of doing that. I helped the National Academy, chaired this particular panel, Abrupt Climate Change. We looked at things like North Atlantic shutdown or ice sheet collapse. Other people are thinking about ecosystem discontinuities. They're thinking changes in El Ninos and other sorts of things. <laughs> What we found, what other people are finding, if you're worried about tipping over the canoe and having a tipping point, if you lean really slowly and carefully, it's not as likely to tip as if you go really fast and hard. And so what do we find is that larger or faster changes make it more likely that we're going to trigger one of these nasty things. And when the IPCC asked the experts, how worried are you, the bigger the change, the more worried the experts were. Now remember, if none of this happens, the impacts of the warming are such that the, coupling the climate model to the economic model says that you would be wise to start investing now. And the ethicist says you would be wise to start investing more now. But when you put the uncertainties in, Fast, large changes might dump an ice sheet. Fast, large changes might cause a discontinuity in something that's out there and bring really huge, really fast changes to a whole lot of people. Okay. So we come back to where we are, and we've got a best estimate, and that best estimate says if you want to optimize the economy, get in the game now. And yeah, things might be a little better, and they might be a little worse, but we've got a long tail of this distribution. And the harder and faster we kick the climate, the more likely we are to end up in that long tail and fly into a cliff somewhere. Okay, so what I want you to do is remind you to watch out for the long tail of the distribution. It's right out there. Um, because long tails of distributions can be fairly dangerous, and they really can bite you if you're not careful. And so, so when you look at the uncertainties, what do we know? A lot of people say, well, wait until you're sure. Just make sure that the science is all the way there. You're positive. All right. Now, in fact, we don't do that with anything else in the world. You may not pass a budget until you're absolutely positive, 100% sure you know what the economics are going to do. Okay. If you put the uncertainties in, the models that I've seen tend to say, well, invest more now because buy insurance against what's coming. Okay, some of us do buy insurance, and we have airbags in our cars. Okay. High scientific confidence. Our actions, our fossil fuel burning and other things are changing the climate. That's affecting us and others. The changes so far are very small compared to what can happen under business as usual. The changes do, some people might be winning now, more losers, and the losers come to dominate completely as we run into the future. There really are cost-effective solutions. Um, and response does appear economically wiser than business as usual. And if we slow down, maybe you can tame that long tail. And long tails are tameable. And I want to leave you with, with an iceberg and a rainbow. It really is possible to have both. And thank you so much.